Good day. Um, before I proceed with this video, just to quickly say that if you're watching this video or any of our other videos, videos from the Duran, Alex Christoforou, or indeed myself, Alexander Mercuris, on Rumble, if you go to the top of the video, you will see there a red maroon button. If you press that button, that will take you directly to our locals homepage and where you can join our um, active and thriving locals community. And if you choose to become an active member, you can then publish your own exclusive content on our locals homepage. Join me in my uh, Wednesday live streams, which take place exclusively on Locals every Wednesday at 1400 hours Eastern Standard Time, and also publish, uh, 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 publish comments on the threads of articles that you see by others. Well, today um, is the day that has come directly after announcements from Ukraine that the Russians have started their phase two offensive in Donbass. And there's been um, attempts to enlist in purported confirmation of this, an interview, a lengthy interview that the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov gave to the Indian television station India Today, in which he also allegedly confirms that the Russian authorities, the Russian military authorities, have, become, have begun their long-awaited offensive in Donbass. I'm just going to add a word of caution or even scepticism about this. There's been nothing from the Russian Defence Ministry that speaks of a renewed offensive in Donbass. As for Lavrov's interview, I'm providing a link under this video. You can watch it right the way through. It's basically a lengthy discussion about the origins and causes of the Ukrainian conflict. My impression is that his words about the second phase of the operation are not intended to signal any particular offensive action today or yesterday or tomorrow. It's just um, a sequence, sequel to the comments made earlier by Russian officials, such as the Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu and the Russian uh, Chief of Operations of the Russian General Staff, General Rudskoy, um, back in March, that the first phase of the Russian operation in Ukraine had been completed and that the Russians were now starting the next phase, which was their attempt to focus on the battles in Donbass. I say that because my own impression is that there's a misunderstanding about this. I don't get the sense that there's going to be a vast sweep of tank armies across Donbass in quite the way people think. Rather, my impression is that phase two has actually been in existence for several weeks. Um, it's seen a steady incremental rise in shelling, airstrikes on Ukrainian positions right across Donbass and deep strikes right across Ukraine as the Russians systematically take apart uh, Ukraine's industrial and logistics infrastructure and hammer away at the Ukrainian forces that are stationed in Donbass. It doesn't mean that advances are not taking place in some parts of Donbass. It's clear, for example, that the northern group of forces of the Russian military, um, which is striking south from the town of Izium, is steadily increasing the area that it controls. And by the way, looks like it is acting as some kind of magnet for Ukrainian counterattacks. And there have been a whole succession of Ukrainian counterattacks against this grouping, which is clear whose advances are clearly seen by the Ukrainian military as an existential threat. Every one of these offences have got has failed and failed apparently with heavy losses to the Ukrainians. And I wonder whether that isn't actually part of the plan. I said in my programme yesterday that the Russian objective seems to be to grind the Ukrainian army down and creating situations 
where the Ukrainians feel obliged to launch hopeless counterattacks on it, uh, to slow down the creeping advance of Russian forces, which only result in Ukraine suffering more losses, which is going to have increasing difficulties replacing. That seems to me to fit in rather well with my own understanding of what the Russian battle plan in Donbass actually is. So my impression, as I said, is that phase two has actually been in existence, in operation for some time, since March, in fact. I think that, again, um, Russian tactics and strategies are to some extent misunderstood. I think that Lavrov's comments have been misinterpreted or rather overinterpreted. And I would point out that India Today, which after all conducted the interview with him, doesn't seem to give particular emphasis to this uh, throwaway sentence, which some people see as confirmation from Lavrov that phase two has now begun. So that's what I wanted to say about that. Now, in the meantime, and briefly, we're getting more news from Mariupol. And here, are, by the way, there are some contradictions. I say contradictions because I was reading an article yesterday in the Daily Telegraph about the fighting in Mariupol. It claimed that the number of Ukrainian fighters besieged in the Azov-style steelworks numbers about 500. The Russians have put that number at around 1.5 to 2,000. Others put it higher still at 4,000. I would say that there's been a consistent tendency to overstate the total number of Ukrainian troops in Mariupol, as everyone will recall. There were claims at one time that there were 14,500 men bottled up in Mariupol. There were other claims that the actual, the true number was greater than that, running up to 20,000. And a few days ago, the Russian Ministry of Defence gave a figure of 8,100. So I'm not going to try and speculate again on the numbers. What I would say is that it does seem as if Russian special forces <clears throat> have now penetrated into the Azovstal works. They have apparently gained control of the northern area of the factory, area of the factory, which is of course a huge factory. And Ramzan Kadyrov, the chief of the Chechen government, and who is now a lieutenant general in the Russian military and who commands the Chechen forces in uh, Mariupol, who are fighting alongside the Russians, he says that he expects Azovstal to be, um, to be stormed and captured, fully captured, either today or tomorrow. The Russians have, by the way, in the meantime, given yet another opportunity for Ukrainian forces in the Azovstal plant to lay down their arms and to surrender. The Ukrainians, for their part, or at least um, one of the commanders of the Ukrainian troops in Azovstal, has now issued, published a video in which he claims that there are civilians also hiding in the Azovstal factory. I'm afraid I can't confirm or refute that. The Russians have said that they believe that this is not true and they've made various claims about problems that they see with this video. They say that the pictures of civilians that are shown in this video don't really match up with the conditions that are known to exist in the Azovstal steelworks. I'm going to make just two quick observations about this. The first is that I would have expected, if there were civilians in the Azovstal steelworks, that the Ukrainians would have said so much earlier than they have actually done. And the second thing I'm going to say is that um, the Western media seems to be downplaying this story. It isn't widely reporting it, which strongly suggests to me that they're sceptical about it also. And given their scepticism, 
I think I'm justified, apparent scepticism, I think I'm therefore justified in mine. So it could very well be that the siege of Mariupol is now about to end. And of course, we are seeing more fighting in Donbass. In fact, we're seeing more fighting in Donbass all the time. There's another issue, however, that I do want to talk about, and this is that there's now been a flurry of articles in the US media, um, one in Bloomberg on the 14th of April, one on CNN on the 16th of April, and this reinforces an impression one is increasingly getting from comments by other Western governments, and that is that Western arms supplies to Ukraine are starting to falter, that the Western governments have found that the more arms they supply to, the, to Ukraine, the more arms Ukraine needs. Um, there's even a suggestion that Ukraine runs through in a day the amount of anti-tank we weapons that it's been provided by the United States, which are intended to cover it for a whole week. Moreover, the article in Bloomberg suggests that some uh, types of weapons that the US has been supplying, javelins and stingers, javelin anti-tank weapons, stinger anti-aircraft weapons, that the numbers of them in US arsenals are now becoming increasingly depleted, causing concern that this is going to call, that this is going to leave the U.S. military itself short of these types of weapons, and that the and that Ukraine, Ukraine's demands are so great that the United States is finding it all but impossible to keep up with them. The same article in Bloomberg also suggests that um, the capacity for the United States to produce ever more numbers of these weapon systems is now limited, that it's running up against manufacturing and labor constraints. And Bloomberg somewhat laments the difference between the situation today, where the United States is running up against these difficulties, and the previous historical events of the Second World War, where the United States was able to mass produce almost unlimited numbers of weapons, cheap, reliable, simple, but very effective weapons, um, almost without effort or without apparent effort. So this is an interesting fact. And it seems, and this we get from CNN now, that US officials, military officials, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, the US Chief of Staff, General Milley, have now been frantically phoning up the US's European NATO allies to try to get them to increase their arms supplies to Ukraine. But it seems that these allies are also running up against the same sort of problems. One hears that East European states have now practically run through their own stocks of um, Soviet-era weapons and that their supplies are becoming depleted as well. And the German government has outright said that it simply doesn't have more weapons, or at least more heavy weapons, to give to Ukraine over above those that it has already provided, and that it has to now start husbanding its own supplies, or it will, be, or it will itself run dangerously short of weapons. Now, this seems to contrast with the situation on the other side, because what we see is that the Russians are not only continuing their military operations in Ukraine, they have been steadily over the last few weeks or days escalating them. And we see this with ever larger, greater numbers of missile strikes across Ukraine and obviously massive use of heavy artillery in all sorts of places in and around uh, Ukraine, but especially focused in Donbass. And I'm going to make a guess here that one of the reasons why the Russians are stepping up their missile strikes is because productions, production of ammunition and missiles has been stepped up 
in Russian factories. In other words, the Russians are doing exactly what Bloomberg laments the US is finding increasingly difficult. It is cranking up arms production to the point where it can increase the tempo of strikes and um, air attacks across Ukraine by providing the Russian armed forces with unlimited numbers or seemingly unlimited numbers of these missiles and strike means. So that's what I suspect is happening. Of course, I can't confirm it. This is speculation. But the articles in Bloomberg and CNN are indisputable and they speak, it seems to me, for themselves. Meanwhile, we're also getting reports that the Ukrainian forces that are now fighting on the front line, especially in places like Izium, are increasingly made up of reservists. The Ukraine's front line contract troops have already been committed to the battle for some time and that Ukraine is starting to run short of those. And the result is that um, more of these reservists are now being thrown to the battle. Some of them, apparently, or a, a large proportion of them from Western Ukraine. And of course, many of them, unfortunately, and tragically, are dying. Now, that may provide the context for President Zelensky's and Ukrainian officials' claims that phase two of the operation is now, Russian operation, is now underway. As I said, I suspect that phase two has been underway for some time. And my impression of Lavrov's interview, by the way, is that that was essentially what he said. I think that um, Zelensky's comments and those comments from other Ukrainian officials are a reflection of their growing alarm at the ammunition and uh, uh, weapons crisis that Ukraine is facing about the fact that most of its armoured fleet has been destroyed and uh, articles in Bloomberg and CNN and elsewhere make the point that the replacements from Eastern Europe, you know, the tanks and armoured vehicles and such things are simply not enough to make up again for the scale of losses. Anyway, I think Zelensky's comments are a reflection of this alarm and another attempt to get the West to commit more weapons or possibly even to intervene directly in the conflict itself. In other words, it's not so much about phase two, it is more about the deterioration in Ukraine's military position in Donbass. And he might get some of what he wants, because I'm hearing that President Biden of the United States has called together another virtual meeting of European leaders, as presumably he tries to find some further way to help Ukraine out of its difficulties. It's possible, of course, that we'll see more sanctions. It's possible also that we'll see some further attempts to send more arms supplies. But either way, it's clear that this is a war of attrition. And it's a war of attrition that's been fought at an economic level, with the West now suffering increasing inflation problems, seeing imminent contractions in its economy. Um, and it is also a, a war of military attrition in uh, Ukraine itself, where the Ukrainian army is being gradually ground down and where, amazingly, even US arms stocks, even Western arms stocks, are being frittered away to no effective purpose. Now, what to do in a situation like this? I'm going to say it again, and I, I cannot repeat this too strongly or often enough. This idea of fighting Russia to a standstill in Ukraine or trying to sanction Russia to destruction, this is causing enormous damage to the fabric of Western societies. And of course, it is proving catastrophic for Ukraine itself. It's 
debatable how much of Ukraine is going to survive this process. And um, whatever is left, if anything is left, is going to be a broken, bankrupt and exhausted country. Um, it's also, as we see, costing the lives of thousands of young men. Young men on the Russian side, young men on the Ukrainian side too, in much greater number, as I am sure. And by the way, I'm going to make one further point here, which is that these comments from Bloomberg, from CNN, from other places about the extent of Ukrainian weapon systems and ammunition losses, to my mind, ultimately corroborate the claims that the Russians are making about the number of systems, uh, um, not just um, ammunition depots and um, headquarters and such things, but the number of weapon systems, tanks, armoured vehicles and the rest that the Russians say that they're destroying. It's a kind of cack-handed admission from the media in the West that these briefings we're getting from the Russian Defence Ministry are essentially accurate on these matters. So we're seeing a war of military attrition which is grinding Ukraine down. We're seeing an economic war of attrition which is causing major problems for Western economies. We're seeing many, many people die. And we are also seeing that the United States and the NATO alliance is rapidly going through its weapon stocks with the prospect of having to replace them by massive increases in military spending at a time when financial pressures in the United States and in the Western countries are also already growing more intense. And of course, spending on arms is a further way to inflame, to increase, if you like, the um, inflation crisis across the West. So, this doesn't make any kind of sense to me. And I'm going to repeat once more the point I have made so many times. Now, here I'm going to come back again to that interview that Lavrov gave in India today, for India Today. Most of the interview, by far the greater part of it, is a discussion about the bad faith of the Western powers, of their complacency and arrogance, and of long, exhaustive, and ultimately failed negotiations. I've, in many programs, said essentially the same thing. I recently said that the um, um, war that we're seeing, the economic crisis that we are seeing, the... Um, exhaustion um, of Ukraine, the depletion of Western weapon systems, the worldwide inf inflation crisis, the worldwide food and energy crises seem exorbitantly high prices to pay, given that this war could have been so easily avoided by conceding that NATO does not actually have an open door and that Ukraine would never be invited to join NATO and by also accepting that the Minsk agreement should be implemented as it was written and as it was confirmed by the UN Security Council. Now, how much more are we prepared to pay for this intransigence? Lavrov despite everything, see, still seemed to me to give the impression that the Russians would be prepared to come to some kind of negotiated settlement if the option to do so was there. Much of the interview is a series of bitter comments from Lavrov about the fact that the Ukrainians appeared to make so, certain significant concessions three weeks ago at the talks in Istanbul, and then the Russians then took various moves to de-escalate the situation, like pulling back their troops from the areas around Kiev, only for the Ukrainians at that point to go back and to retract all the concessions that they had made. Well, the very fact that 
Lavrov talks in that way, suggests that he and other Russian officials, presumably up to and including President Putin himself, might still be willing to negotiate some kind of settlement if that path were opened up. Maybe, almost certainly in fact, it would not be a deal that bore much resemblance to the deal that we saw, uh, that might have been, that we, we might have seen a few months ago, which could have avoided the war. But, surely, whatever the deal is, even it may, even if it means that Ukraine is going to lose Donbass and it's going to lose Crimea, well, it's already essentially lost Crimea and it's soon going to lose Donbass anyway. Even if it loses even more territory, even if it loses Kherson region and perhaps Zaporozhye and conceivably even Kharkov region, surely that is better than what we are seeing. Now, this is not a call for capitulation. I'm not suggesting that relations between the West and Russia could go back to what they were. I think that if the Germans and the West European countries want to phase out imports of Russian energy, um, economically unwise on any calculus that that might be, well, that is their sovereign right and that they can do. Only all I am saying is let them do it over time. The Western powers want to take all kinds of other things if they want to keep Russia at bay. Well, again, some may say that that is not the wisest or best thing to do. But again, it is their sovereign right to do it. But all I am saying is let's try and find an off ramp to this war. Because all that we are doing, or so it seems to me, is bringing about the deaths of more people in Ukraine, more destruction to Ukraine, potential loss of more territory for Ukraine, conceivably months from now, who knows, the end of Ukraine itself. Meanwhile, our arsenals of weapons are depleting so that if there is a military crisis somewhere in the world, which is entirely possible, by the way. There's talk of a conflict over Taiwan. There's highly likely to be a crisis in the Middle East before long. Well, we're going to be short of weapons to deal with it. And, of course, that might not be a bad thing if it deters us from getting involved in further adventures. But, well, presumably we want to keep that kind of option open. And, of course, in the meantime, we see more hardship amongst Western publics. Lots of brave talk about, you know, changing thermostats and wearing, you know, more pullovers and keeping warm under heavier blankets and that sort of thing. But, of course, it's industrial companies that will be really paying the price. And the real price will be in jobs, not in more pullovers. So, you know, and of course, I'm not even going to start on the problems all this is creating in the global south. This stubborn, obstinate, intransigent refusal to talk to negotiate, to understand that the other side has a point, that the other side generally sees this as an existential issue, is driving us ever faster over a cliff. Well, I don't get much indication that anybody in leadership positions in the West can see that. And for the moment, all the talk is of further escalation and further trouble. But in the meantime, it seems to me that it's incumbent on me to make these points, even if, like the prophetess in Greek mythology, these counsels are not heeded. Well, thank you for joining me again today. I look forward to you joining me again in future programmes on this channel and on our main channel, The Duran. Please remember that you can find us on other platforms I mentioned uh, Rumble and Locals at the start of this program, but we are available on other platforms too. You can find links under this video. Please also join us, uh, or rather, please also, you can support us via Patreon and Subscribestar. You can also go to our shop and buy the many things that you will find there. And last but not least, if you've liked this program, 
please remember to press the like button and please also check your subscription to this channel. Thank you for joining me again today and have a very good day until we speak again. Thank you.